We talk a lot about crimes committed by children, but it is not often that we get to hear from some of those young people until right now. WMAR 2 News Mark Roper was granted exclusive access to a group of teens who were incarcerated at the Victor Cullen Center. These teens hoping to put their troubled past behind them. And Mark, you, you talk to some of these young people about what led them to where they are. Once they're in the system, where do some of those juveniles end up? Good morning, Christian. There are a lot of options for kids, but for some of them, there are six residential facilities in Maryland that work with incarcerated teens. But the, all of the kids that we spoke with are at the Victor Cullen Center in Frederick County. And because they're either minors or enter the system as juveniles, we are keeping their identities anonymous as it's their stories that we want you to hear. And the specifics of their cases are confidential. Physical barriers make the Victor Cullen Center one of Maryland's most secure placement facilities for teens convicted of a crime. But those inside describe a harsh life on the outside. I kept saying my mom cry. She would try to hide it. You feel me? Like she would try to make sure she in her room quiet, try to cry quietly. And I'm like, why is she crying? And my brother, my older brother came to me and was like, Ma, you, Ma's laying on the room. You, we about to get kicked out and try to help my mom out. So that's why I led me up to the decisions I made to end up in here. I grew up in Baltimore City. I grew up all over. My mom was on Section 8, so we was always moving from place to place, but I mostly grew up in East Baltimore. Growing up in Baltimore, is got to grow up fast. One out of every four kids placed into a state juvenile justice facility comes from Baltimore City. I started off at 12 years old selling drugs, you feel me, for older, older dudes, just because I thought I had to. I didn't see no other option. I didn't want to look for no other option, you know? And then when I turned 14, my father overdosed off heroin. For Lamar, survival meant doing whatever he had to do. A lot of us is faced with responsibilities that children are supposed to be faced with. I never had no father figure in my life. My mom, my mom was a single mom of six kids. So growing up, I just had to do what I had to do to, to provide for my mom and my brothers and sisters. But Mike grew up with a father in his life who made him work for what he wanted. My upbringing is so much different than like other kids or like other kids. You just, mom, this and that, can I, can I get these shoes? This and that, mom, can I get these shoes? They're like, yeah, this and this, go ahead. Because I got that kind of money, but like for me, like, I really got to earn it. Instilling a strong work ethic should have kept Mike out of trouble, but an inability to control his temper became a problem for him in high school. I met this girl, uh, like, kind of like, I got super involved with her. So any little thing, I would always be, like, just be someone up for talking to her all that. Lamar also developed a work ethic, except his earned him more trouble than he bargained for. I'd never seen people be successful with jobs and stuff like that. All the people I seen with jobs was working nine to fives and was barely getting by with the checks that they was getting. So I just started doing what I saw the fast money people doing. And that's what I thought was the right way. Of course, not recognizing it was the wrong way led the kids we talked with on a path straight to incarceration. I spent time and I got kicked out. I spent time in another placement and got kicked out. And this is my last resort. The first time ever getting locked up, they already saw like a pattern of my behavior. I, I, was, I was 15, sent me straight to placement. At the end of the day, I look at it like it was a blessing, me getting caught. At the time, I, I did get caught. And surprisingly, some of the kids that we talked with were actually happy that they got caught as it was the first time in their lives that many of them were actually being held accountable for their actions. And coming up in about 30 minutes, we'll hear from these kids who tell us what it was like when they found out that they were going to be incarcerated. And we got a lot of time with these kids who were very candid about what led them to this point in their lives and where they're headed next. And again, we're keeping their identities anonymous because they are working on changing their lives. Christian? Yeah, we'll check back in with you shortly, Mark. It's an important series, and it is so rare uh, that we ever hear from juveniles who've been convicted of crimes in juvenile court. i got to ask how you got the access inside the Victor Cullen Center. Well, you know, it's something they say they don't normally do, but I pitched them an idea for a story, and they kind of liked the idea, so they went along with it. And basically, I wanted to know, we hear a lot of stories about what happens to, we see a lot of stories about teens that are in the news who are committing violent crimes, and I wanted to know what happens to those kids after we hear that they're convicted. What happens next? So I pitched them the idea that I wanted to know, talk to some of these kids who end up in the juvenile justice system, find out what happens to them next, how they're working on improving their lives, and they like that idea because they wanted to show 
know that for kids that do commit crimes, that there is hope for them, a better hope and a better future for them if they work on it. Christian? Okay.